And welcome back to the last segment of Voices from Afar, uh, currently known as the Freedom Link. I almost forgot the name of the old show I had. I, I didn't see it, but if I may, because uh, we're having such a great time here, and I was hoping to talk a little bit about the uh, aftermath of this election and what Donald Trump has uh, in some cases, deliberately, I'm sure, but I think in other cases, quite inadvertently revealed to us. Please do. Well, during the break, we were talking about Kennedy and his assassination. And I think in this, since this election, uh, when we've seen this incredible display from so many Hillary Clinton supporters, but in particular, the young people, the young adults, or they're supposed to be adults, young adults, and I, and I look at how upset they are, and I understand why, because they've been sold a bill of goods. They've, uh, they're the victims of a tremendous, carefully crafted reality shift. All this Frankfurt School political correctness, uh, cultural Marxism, and that there's just this, you know, it's human rights. Like, you know, you, you can't say that stuff. You're, you're going to be an evil person and everything. They're, they're, they're phony baloney because they supposedly care about the human rights of transgendered people and all of this and women's rights and all of that here in the United States. And they could, they, they're totally ignorant of the rights of the people of Libya, who their hero, you know, Hillary Clinton has just totally trashed. All of these poor people from Syria that are looking for a home now. There are 300,000 people in Syria dead, okay? What about their human rights? Your champion Hillary kicked all of that stuff off. They're, 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 they don't know anything about it. But they, they're stressed by the fact that the uh, – uh, by what? By the exercise of the democratic system process in our country has stressed them out. And the result of that process has gotten them so upset, okay – Fine. You want to demonstrate? That's fine. That's what they told me I was in the army for. So you're right to demonstrate. Beautiful. Okay. And that, but they're trashing things and they're going to now, not my president, all of this stuff. Yo, come on. And there's college kids here and you can look the articles up. I don't know if you've discussed it on your show, but the, this is a, an incredible threat to the whole peace political correctness project because now Political correctness is so inherently truthful and, 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 and right. How could Donald Trump have become the president? Well, the only way is that the rest of the country is all a bunch of ignorant racists. That Otherwise, uh, you know, it really calls their whole reason to be in, into question. Yo, kids, and, and they're going and they've got safe. Did you know they had safe rooms for them, safe spaces on college campus to go to with Play-Doh and coloring books? Yeah, and, and they had crying corners. And hugging sessions. Play-Doh, coloring books, <laughs> the university students, yeah, yeah. okay? All right, university students, you want to know what stress is? You want to know what political stress is? How about when William and I was 10 years old and our beautiful, glorious, taking us blazingly into the future president was murdered, okay, in front of the whole world? How about that for some stress? And I'll tell you what happened to me on that day. Ten years – I had just turned 10 in October. My family had just moved to northern Virginia from Long Island, New York. My father was working for AT&T. He got transferred from Manhattan to Washington, D.C. He got down there earlier in the year, and we finished school. And then during the summer, he moved us down there in the suburbs of Fairfax, Virginia, northern, northern Virginia, right outside – 14 miles outside of Washington in a brand-new subdivision. <laughs> in, that, in that subdivision – it was just loaded with uh, officers at the Pentagon, you know, and they'd come for, they'd be there a couple of years and then they'd, they'd move. Captain, uh, Air Force captain around the corner just got back from Vietnam flying uh, Phantom jets and stuff like that. A colonel in the Air Force lived next door to us. He and his wife had two daughters and a son. We all went to the same public school. We'd ride the school bus, we'd go to the school. So on this particular day, at the end of the day, we're on the platform getting ready to go on the bus and the ripple goes through the crowd. The president's been shot. And it's, wow, what's going on? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, there's my next door neighbor, the colonel's wife, with her three kids. And she says, come on, Tommy, you know, get your brothers. I'll drive you home. Now, first of all, this is totally unexpected. Secondly, it's great. Oh, man, we don't have to ride the bus and drop everybody. We'll get a ride right home. Okay, great. And we're in the car. She had a, I can remember to this day, a, a Ford station wagon with the rocket ship taillights on it and everything. 
And the radio's on. Uh, and by the way, uh, around that time, Johnny Cash's song "Ring of Fire," you know, was a hit. And it, <laughs> I think it was a metaphor for the country. I fell into a burning ring of fire, and it went down, 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 and the flames kept getting higher. We're listening to the radio in disbelief. Now the president's dead. All of this stuff. So I said, uh, Mrs. So and So, I won't mention the family's name on the air. Why did you come to get us today at school? Why? Why didn't we? Why couldn't we just ride the bus home? You know what her answer was. In 1963, a woman whose husband was a colonel at the Pentagon told young Tom here, who was 10 years old, the president has just been shot. I don't know if there's a coup going on or something like that, but I need to know where my children are. Oh, okay. damn straight. All it right. Was a, it was a coup. Okay. But this woman tells me that. Now, you all who didn't like Trump, you want stress? Try that one. Okay. Try that one. And this was the days when, do you remember Seven Days in May, the film? That's a film that needs to be remade. Remember Seven Days in May? I do. Okay. And uh, The Manchurian Candidate. These things were films. John Kennedy wanted that film made, Seven Ooh. Days in May. Did you know that? I, I, you, you just sent chills through me. Go ahead. Seven Days in May is a dramatization of a military coup that takes place uh, during Seven Days in May in, in the United States of America. It was a book and, and, and then a movie. Kurt Douglas is in it. Okay. Burt Lancaster, I think, played the general. The, uh, yeah. All right. And this was uh, – this was this stuff was being portrayed dramatically during the height of the Cold War. They should remake that film. Okay. Kennedy wanted – I think Franken was the, the director. He wanted that film made so bad that he actually uh, vacationed on Cape Cod – at a strategic moment, allowing the film crew to come into the White House and film. All right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff, and Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick, you know, that's the kind of stuff that was going on at the time. So if, this ki if kids today want to know about political stress, that's only the beginning for young Tom, okay, at 10 years old. What happens next? The country falls into a burning ring of fire. Lyndon Johnson – Lyndon Johnson cuts loose all the restraints that President Kennedy had about going into Vietnam. And in a short time, we've got a half a million American soldiers killing Vietnamese people and getting killed themselves. OK, yeah. and there's no end to it. There's no it gets worse and worse. By 1968, uh, you know, by 1968, uh, Johnson's not going to run. The whole world is blowing up. Uh, you had the Quezon Offensive uh, in the beginning, the Tet Offensive actually in the beginning of that year, and then Quezon. The country just saw th there's not going to be an end to this war. All right. Now I I'm, I'm a few years older, but guess what, friends? The draft was in place, so ten year old Tommy here is looking at the Vietnam War, and every year that goes by, that damn war is getting worse and worse, and I'm getting closer and closer to the chomping jaws of the draft. OK, I was on a conveyor belt to a meat grinder for 10 years. That's stress. OK, that's stress. So you have to look at as a young man in those days, you have to look at, you know, I'm this goddamn war is an ending and I'm getting closer and closer to it. And then finally, you know, uh, at, by the time I was in high school, at the end of my high school time, uh, the draft lottery comes up. I'm talking to a friend of mine's sister on the phone, a very uh, a lovely girl who was a really good friend of mine, and she was in a great mood. And I said to her, why are you so happy? She says, because the draft just came out and my brother got this really high number. And I said, oh, gee, yeah, it did yesterday, didn't it? And she said, yeah, yeah. I said, I wonder what my number was. And she said, uh, well, what was your birthday? I told my birthday. She was, <gasps> and I said, what do you mean? <gasps> she said, I think your number is 10. Uh-huh. And that's what it was. Oh, my God. Because I, I lived through that, too. And my my cosmic number is 327. My status was 1H, not being processed for induction. But, yes, I was in uh, junior high school when one of the teachers went into what the Vietnam War was and what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. And he looked at us and he said, don't think that none of you in this class are going to be going to that war. And you talk about stress. You're exactly right. For 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Hanging over your head, the sword of Damocles. Now, uh, I just made plans to join the military because by then, if you joined for an extra year or two, you could 
have a say in what your occupation specialty was and where you were going to be stationed. Fortunately, I, f- I got a deal. I cut a deal with the military. I served in what was called West Berlin as a photography uh, uh, photo lab technician, and I avoided Vietnam altogether because I totally didn't believe in that war. Uh, but the reason these kids are out on the streets protesting Donald Trump is because there's not a draft anymore. And there's snowflakes. If there was a draft, they would be killing and dying in Hillary Clinton's wars. Wake them up. (laughs) I refer to them as snowflake slime. You know, when any warmth comes in, they just melt. And so they're out there, you know, protesting what they think is the good, which is not. But... (laughs) God bless them. It's the fourth turning. They have to do something, and they're just a little misdirected. Well, oh. I agree. I, my 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 initial inclination uh, when my lower self takes over is to use pejoratives and everything. But really, that's that's what they use on me. Okay, I, <laughs> there was a, a hipster in the drugstore the other night. My wife and I were in there, and we got into a, uh, an altercation about something really stupid. He. He misrepresented the situation and basically called me and the cashier a liar. But uh, the the thought occurred to me was that, you know, this kid can't see reality in front of his face. So mm-hmm. after we left, he went one way, I went the other. And I yelled back to him. I said, you know, Donald Trump won because of people like you. Now, <laughs> I didn't say I like Donald Trump. I didn't say I voted for Donald Trump. I didn't even say I'm mad at you because Donald Trump won. I just said, you know what? People like you who can't see reality. I didn't see anything. I just always said Donald Trump won because of people like you. He and his little girlfriend started screaming at me. You're a racist. You're a misogynist. (laughs) Can you imagine? That was it. That was it. So I don't want to do to them what they're doing to me. You know, they need to wake up. And I don't think you wake people up by calling them deplorable despicables, even if they are. You know, you you wake them up by talking truth to them and, and, and sticking with it, you know. And the, and the mm-hmm. truth is, if if we were getting paid fifteen hundred dollars a week to protest the Vietnam War, I think it might have ended a little bit sooner. 